Welcome to MIOSH Incident Reporting and Investigation Webinar. Today we're going to look at how to log an incident, investigate one, and then sign it off. Uh, we will just have a very, very brief look at some of the reporting that goes along with that. And we'll have a look at some of the setup that you have to create in order to ensure that the investigation goes smoothly. Now, fortunately, when it comes to classic and custom versions of MIOSH, large and small company versions, the incident reporting module is one of those that is, with very few exceptions, almost the same. So I'm going to concentrate on the large company version, and I'll just point out a few things that are not available in classic, not an awful lot. What we're currently looking at is the dashboard, and as you can see, there are a number of dashboard widgets that are incident related. Now, if you have the dashboard, you can, of course, generate these as you like. But in order to generate these reports, what you have to have is data sitting behind it, and you have to have correctly investigated data as well. So what we'll do is we'll go and have a look at incident reporting and lodge an incident report to start off with. Always remember that when you take on MIOSH, what you get is the MIOSH app. So you can, of course, lodge an incident on your phone or tablet. Using the phone or tablet is just like using uh, the PC itself. All of the notifications work and get sent out once you lodge something on that phone. So to start off with, we'll create a new record. As with all modules in MIOSH, mandatory fields, in this case, colored yellow, clearly noticeable, forces you to complete them. You can't submit any documents in MIOSH without filling in all of the mandatory fields. In order to make it a little easier, a lot of them are drop down lists. So who was the reporting person? Let's say uh, Thomas. Uh, who was the person involved? We'll say Winston Churchill. Uh, what was the occur date? You select these, they're just easily selectable. Nothing, no typing at the moment. Person's an employee. And then what we get to is a brief description of the incident. So what you want here is to type something like person injured tripping over a tire. So we're not typing a life story here. We're just typing something brief because when this is submitted as an, an, a notification to somebody, the brief description is going to appear in that notification. Is a third party involved? Now, if you have an incident report that, in, let's say you're riding, driving around, uh, you have a vehicle incident, someone crashes into the back of your car, there's a third party involved. If you click yes, what it will do is it will ask you for details of that third party name, address, phone number, those sorts of things. So you're able to log that kind of thing as well. But when it comes to type of report, there's a drop down list. And this drop down list is almost exactly the same as for classic as, as it is for custom. These are different types of incidents. Now, depending on what you select, you will see different information. So it's not as though Myosh is going to open this massive long form and show you a little bit of everything for every type of incident. It won't do that. If you open an, an incident that happens to be a near miss or a near hit, what it will do is only show you information related to that sort of incident. And this means that the reporting form is a lot shorter, of course. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at an injury because injury is the most complex. And you'll see that it's really not that difficult once we go through it. We have non-work-related options. This means if someone's at work, uh, they choke on their lunch at work, uh, it's not a work-related incident, although it happened at work, you can select it as such. If they arrive at work having injured themselves at home, you can still log it. But by clicking on non-work-related, this means that it does not affect your statistics in any way. And you can still search on all non-work-related incidents. Anything that's confidential will only be available to the people investigating the incident and the names of people inserted here. So if I were to select any of these names, only these people and the people investigating the incident would be able to see this incident. If it was a lost time injury or a medical treatment injury, it would affect your statistics, even though it was effectively invisible to, any, to most people. Now, once we click next, what Marsh does is says, right, you've selected an injury. I'm now going to show you only the fields that you need in order to log an injury. 
Now, these would be completely different if you'd selected environment, near hit, whatever. There's a set of drop down lists. These values have been taken from the Australian standards. It's a subset, obviously, but because it's a drop down list, you are in control of this list. So if you don't like any of these values, you can remove them, replace them entirely with your own values, or just add new values that are appropriate to whatever it is you do. We'll say it's a sprain and a strain. Bodily location, well, this person fell from a height, so let's say shoulders, hands. Again, keywords that you can change. The next set of fields here is a list of fields that come again from the standards. And any of these fields that are about a one line wide, they take about 100 characters. So again, it's brief information. So we'll just put in some details here, put details into each of those. You then have an area called details in which you can expand upon the brief description that we entered up here. So this field here and any field that looks like this, a larger field, gives you the ability to pretty much type as much as you need and keeps on scrolling down. Some immediate temporary controls, we can add those in. We can select witness names. Now you can either type these names in or you can select from the list of people in your organization. You can attach as many documents as you like. If you'd done this on a phone, you would of course take photographs. But if you're doing this as I am on a PC, you can upload any photographs that have been taken. You can attach police reports. There's no limit to the number or type of document that you can attach. And then what you do is you send this to someone who has been pre-configured as a person who can investigate an incident. Now, this is very important because if you have an organization that has multiple sites, let's say you're across Queensland and New South Wales, and you have an incident that occurs in Brisbane, you don't want to be sending this information to someone who's working in Bateman Bay down in New South Wales for them to investigate. You need to ensure that you have the correct people in the correct areas investigating incidents that occur where they, ha they happen to be. And in order to make this happen, what you have to do is you have to create configuration documents. So on the left, the left hand side, we've still got our incident report. On the right, what we have is a set of configuration documents. And if we notice here at the top, this particular incident has occurred at the Mount Bryant site. If we look on the right, we've got a Mount Bryant location document or configuration document. And in here, what we've done is we've said, when it comes to incident reporting, here's a list of supervisors. And that list there is the same list that you see here. So this means that our one-time configuration, you can set up who does what in particular areas of your business, and then every incident that occurs in that area of the business has to obey the rules that you've set up. Now, we'll come back to this in a moment. Back in our incident report, we're going to choose one of these people. And let's say we send this off to Angela. And once we've completed this incident report, we're now going to send it off to Angela, click Submit, and away it goes. Now, what will happen with Angela is that she will receive a notification. She'll receive it in her inbox. She can click on the link and open the document. She can click on My Incidents over here, and any incident that's been assigned to her will be listed. She can search for an incident that has come to her using the search option up here, or on the main page, there is a My Activities option, which she can click on and click on any incident that happens to be hers, open it up and deal with it. So there are multiple ways that you can find out that you've been assigned incidents to deal with. As the person investigating, you might click on the link in your email, open the document. Now, over here on the top right hand corner is the status of this particular incident. All that has happened so far is that this incident has been lodged and sent somebody to investigate. The investigation now needs to start. So the first thing that you're going to do is review the information that's been sent to you. And once you've done that, you need to define the incident. Now, in this case, what's happened is we've been told it's an injury. We don't yet know what kind of injury. And this is where you as the investigator would make that decision. There are a set number in classic. This is one of the differences. There are a number of different types of incident. And when it comes to classic, you pretty much have to go with what's provided. When it comes to custom, we provide the default set, but if you have any esoteric types, we can build them in, no problem at all. 
For this example, I'm going to choose a medical treatment injury. So this is fairly severe. And what we now have to do is we have to actually rate this in terms of its severity. So in order to do this, we take your matrix, we build it into MIOSH, we make it interactive so that when you hover over the links or the definitions, it shows you what's going on below. And of course, what we're doing here is we're not risk rating an incident. We're actually classifying it in terms of how severe it was. So rather than looking at the numbers, we're more looking at those colored lines, rows down below, meaning that if we click on a purple, it's going to be a medium level incident. And it doesn't matter which purple we click on. So by clicking on a nine, what this does is it doesn't put a nine into MIOSH, it puts a two. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to our configuration documents, what it means is if we categorize the incident as a two, we have set up in our configuration document who gets notified based on that classification. So you can set up based on your matrix and the classification numbers, who gets notified for various severities of incident within your organization. And again, you do this once, doesn't take very long, and every incident that occurs in that area of your business will now have to obey these notifications. When it comes to classic, classic does not have a potential worst case category. It's one of the few differences between the two. So effectively, if you're a custom client, what you would be doing is you would be notifying people about the actual incident category, but you would be investigating at the worst case. In classic, you just get the one, so you notify and investigate at the same level. Externally reportable, does it need to go to work cover, work safe? If you click on yes, MIOSH does not send any notifications out to these external organizations. It changes the workflow and sends it to somebody within your own organization who is tasked with managing those or talking to those external organizations. And this is where it's very, very important to press the update button. If you don't, the status is still new report. So new report, if you were doing this manually, is effectively the report has landed on your desk. You've had a cursory look at it, but haven't really investigated it. If you don't press update, it remains in that status. The moment that you do press update, those notifications to people who want to know that a category two incident occurred, they go out and the form now changes and shows you only the fields that you need for a medical treatment injury of this, in this case, category three, because we're investigating at the potential worst case. So now there's a whole stack of new fields that you need to complete as part of your investigation. And by clicking on that link, what has happened is that the status has changed from new report to open report. So now it's an open investigation. So what we can do here is we can click on the time the incident occurred, the shift that the incident occurred. We have a look here and we see that this person is an accountant and they've injured their arm falling out of a truck. Well, as the investigator of the incident, what you have is access to the people in your in environment. So any people listed in your contacts database, if they have been involved in an incident, you can see their details without actually going there. And you do that by clicking on this link here. So if I click on that link, what it does is it opens up a little dialog box and shows me the details of the person involved in the incident. And whatever information you've put into that person document is available to you here. If you have also had the training management module as part of your solution, and you're filling that out religiously, it will also show you all of the training details that this person has had up to the point that they got injured. And if you scroll down a little further, it shows you all of the associated incidents that this person has been involved in prior to the one that you are now currently investigating. So a whole lot of information available to you without going anywhere else in the system, all straight from the incident report. So we'll scroll back down a little bit. We've got some main tasks. What does this person get up to during the day? We've got the bodily location and the nature of injury, which were added when we logged this incident. But now we've got investigative information, drop down lists. What was the mechanism of the injury? Let's say he fell from a height, he fell out of a vehicle. What was the breakdown agency? It was road transport. These again are keywords. They're in the keywords module. You can change them if you don't like them. We scroll down a little further. There's a sequence of events. You can add that information. 
there's an immediate and contributing factors. Now, these are keywords as well. You have to put in some details of why you selected these and you have root causes that are again our keywords and again some details. Now, this is where there's a, one of the larger differences between classic and custom. Because if any of you are looking at doing things like an ICAM investigation, while we don't, as Myosh, have ICAM licenses, what we have done is we have actually set Myosh up so that you can conduct an ICAM-ish type of investigation. This, this is not available in classic. And if instead of saying that the full cause analysis is no, which I have by default, if I select it to yes and re-update, what it will do when it comes to contributing factors is it will take away those default keywords and it will put instead an ICAM type presentation where you can add in information about contributing factors, behavioral values, all of those sorts of things. So if we have a look and say you know, detect detection systems, you can put in some details, you can tick as many of these as you like, and you can see as I'm ticking the buttons or selecting the buttons, the fields become mandatory, so you have to put in some sort of explanation. What this will do as we're adding these in is it will start building up a chart. So if I save this, as a result of creating those, and I scroll down, what this has now started to do is build up this analysis chart of my contributing factors. Only available in custom, and only available if you want to do a complete full analysis. Now, a lot of organizations don't even ever bother with this. Some only do it specifically for very, very serious incidents. Some do it for all, entirely up to you. Recommendations, of course, you want to put in some recommendations, and what you would do maybe is um, update the procedure, maybe add a policy, and I don't know, a bunch of other things. At this point in time, in order to ensure that these things were carried out, what you would want to do is you would want to create actions. Now, the actions module is a completely separate module. Any actions that are created go into the actions module. They are tracked independently of the document from which they originate. And the way to create an action is to come down here and click on create an action. You can create as many actions as you like. They will all get added into this document. There will be a link from the incident to the action and vice versa, but the actions themselves will exist separately in the actions module. And even if you were to close the incident, the actions would remain open until they themselves were closed. And this would be really useful if, for example, you'd had a security incident, let's say a break-in, and one of your corrective actions was to put security bars across all of the windows on the ground floor. Now, that might take days, it might take weeks, but you've investigated your incident, you can then close out your incident, but you can fire off the actions to the people responsible, and those actions then get tracked themselves. And if you ever come into the incident itself, you could click on the links to those actions and see how they were managing on those actions. I won't go into that now because that in itself is another small webinar. What we'll do here though, is we'll say, maybe this incident has occurred as a result of hazards in our environment. Now the hazard register is again, another register in its own right. And you can create hazards from anywhere else. Well, not anywhere, but a lot of places in Marsh. And they, they all go into that single hazard register. And you can do that from inside an incident report. So if I were to log a hazard that I'd never seen before, that I'd only recognized as a result of this investigation, I can click on log hazard and it will take me to that form. I can log the hazard and then go back into the, the incident. Or what I can do is I can select from a list of hazards that's already in my hazard register. And I can say maybe uh, these particular hazards have contributed to this particular incident. And when I submit those hazards, what it does is it builds links to the hazards from inside the incident report. Again, what it means is that a related document to this incident is attached and I don't have to go out of here looking for anything that is related to this incident. So if I wanna look at that particular hazard, I can click on the link and I can go and see exactly how it was managed. Back in our incident report, what we now want to do is we want to send this on the final part of its journey to be investigated. Now, this list here, this list of people who do the investigations and the list of people to whom it gets sent for sign-off, they are 
again, controlled inside this document here, this configuration document. So the supervisors were the people whose names appeared here, and the authorizers are the people's whose the names whose that appear here. So again, you can configure these. And just by the way, if, for example, Jane were to leave the organization and be replaced by somebody else, there is functionality within MIOSH that enables you to replace her name globally across all modules within MIOSH. So if she were to leave and be replaced by Ursula, you could run a little program available to the users, uh, mainly administrators, and it would change Jane's name to Ursula. What we'll do now is we'll send this document off to Richie, and Richie is going to be a person who signs the documents off, hopefully after reviewing the investigation that Angela has now completed. So Richie Rich gets an email. When he clicks on the link in his email, he opens the document. He can look at the audit log. The audit log is a time and date stamp of absolutely everything that has happened to this document since it was created. He can review all of this information, scrolling through it, or if you use these links over here in these light gray bands, you can see here these are little tabs. So if I want to go to the investigation section of an incident, I click on investigation and it takes me there. If I want to go to the bottom, it takes me there. And at the bottom, there is now a sign off section for Richie Rich. And he has three options. He can sign off the report, he can refer the report to other people or reopen the report. So by signing off, it means everything is fine. But there's a comment section here and the comment section is colored yellow and this means it's mandatory. So you have to put in a comment, can't just sign it off. If you want to refer it to somebody else, here's a drop down list of the people to whom you can refer it and each one of them can put in a comment. You then have a history of the comments. Lastly, if you're not satisfied with the investigation, there are elements of it that uh, have been done incorrectly. You can add your comment and then click reopen report. And this will send it back to the person who investigated it, and they will then have to rectify what it was you didn't like, and they will need to resubmit it for, for sign off. And this is an iterative approach. The only time that it gets signed off is when eventually you choose to sign it off. Now, a lot of organizations we've noticed, and we're, we're sort of trying to catch up with them, have done this entire investigation process. But once you've investigated it, really all you've got is a register of an investigation. What you need to be able to do is report on these things. And one of the things that is really important as a lag indicator is your frequency rates, graphs, and charts. And what we found is that a lot of organizations are not doing this. If we just have a quick look at a frequency rate graph, when we create one, what it's doing is it's asking us, we won't go through all of this, but it's asking us to put in a title, choose a report to run, choose a, a level of the organization to run it at, and then it's asking us to roll back from a particular period. If you haven't added any hours work data into the system, then there's not going to be anything here to allow you to roll back from anywhere. So in this case, I'll do a 12 month rolling total and submit it, and this will give me your well-known frequency rate table. That's wonderful, it's easy to produce. But unless you've put hours worked in, none of this is possible. So the place that you have to go in order to do that is in incident reports. And there's a section down here called hours. And when you click on hours, what you have to do is you have to click new record, choose the month ending. So we're almost at the end of August. Choose the number of employees and the number of hours that they've worked and submit it. Now, notice that you can drill down into levels of the business. It depends on what sort of reporting you need to do. If you need to report frequency rates by site, then you're going to need to lodge a number of employees, a number of hours work for every site every month. If you're just going to lodge it at the level of the organization, you don't need to do this. It just depends on you. When it comes to custom, a lot of organizations are really, really large, thousands of employees. Some have quite a few sites. We've got some organizations with over 200 sites. What you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be adding all of that information every month for every site. You'd be there for a week. So what we've done is we've automated that process and we can pull that information in from payroll systems or wherever it happens to be hosted. When it comes to classic, I'm afraid that's a standalone system. So you'd be on your own there. But typically classic organizations are smaller 
and there's not that information, to, that much information to put in. When it comes to reporting on incidents, there are a couple of things that you can do outside of the frequency rate graphs and charts and the dashboards that uh, you've briefly seen and which are part of a different webinar. As with all modules, this view is something that you can play around with. And if you understand Microsoft uh, Outlook, then what you can do here will be very familiar to you. You can, for example, filter on different parts of the view. You can drag columns in the view into any other position. You can search for information in the view. So if we're, for example, searching for someone hit by a dozer, it will just drag that column over here, put it up here, and we'll search for DO. There we go. It finds it very easily. So if we were to say, look, I'm only looking for medical treatment injuries, and what I want to do is I want to export this to some sort of report. I can do this either by clicking on export and extracting it to Excel or to PDF. And what it will do is it will just drop that report into PDF format. Or what I can do is I can review these documents prior to sending them out. So I can click on this toggle button. And what this does is it shows me the documents in a preview window, which is exactly the same as Microsoft. It's resizable, as you can see, switch the toggle off and it goes away. Now, the other option for reporting is an ad hoc reporting tool. And this is available not just inside incident reporting, but in effectively inside pretty much any module in MIOSH. And what this enables you to do is configure your own report. So for example, I might be interested in lodging a report over the, say the last year, and I don't just have to choose date reported. I can look at the occur date of the incident, the close date, whatever I'm after. I can choose a status. So maybe just look at all open reports or all closed reports. I can choose reports that only affected my employees in a particular area of the business, maybe only injury reports where the nature of injury was a sprain or a strain. So you can drill down into the documentation and extract this information at a very low level. What you can also do is in the report output section, you can configure your own report output. In this list of available fields here, what I have is pretty much every field that's in an incident report. And in the output section, I can choose a subset of those values. So for example, I might just choose the incident number, maybe the occur date, possibly the brief description that would be useful, nature of injury, bodily location mechanism, those are all good. And then lastly, associated hazards and maybe any actions that were associated with this. That's enough for now. You can see here that we can extract this to Excel. And as a result, it gives us a report in Excel format. And what I'm able to do is reorder the columns prior to running the report. And finally, what I can do is I can give this report a name. So if I'm ever going to use the report again in the future, I don't need to recreate it because it already exists. I might just want to change the due, the due dates or the, the dates at the top and rerun the same report. I get the same information, but for a different date range. So once I run the report, what it does is it extracts it into Excel format in the column order that I, that I requested, showing the columns that I wanted. And because I've got these additional columns at the end, I have links to the actual documents. So I've got a sprain and a strain. This person fell. I want to go and have a look at that incident. I click on the link and open the documents. And although I'm not in Excel at the moment, had I taken this out to Excel, exactly the same functionality would be available. Sarah, that's about it. Uh, I'm open to questions. Nigel, unless there's something wrong with the question panel, there aren't any questions. Oh, um, that makes it very easy. <laughs> it does. I have a question, though. Yeah. What happens when there's more than one type of incident? Ah, uh, right. Yes. Now, when it comes to incidents that are in classic, there is only one option. And what you're able to do gets there is clone a report. So effectively, if you have, say, a person who's driving a vehicle and they have an accident and they break their arm, what you've got is a vehicle that's potentially written off, but you've also got an uh, a lost time injury potentially as well. So what you would do is you would log information for one of them. It doesn't really matter what. 
And once you'd completed most of the uh, basic information, you would click Clone Report. And what that does is it copies the information, the very basic information, so maybe the information about the vehicle incident, who was involved, all of that information, copies it to a second report. And in that report, you can then change the report to a lost time injury, which is uh, related to the broken arm. The two reports will then be linked together, and you'll be able to open either one and see the link to the uh, related incident in there. And in this way, there could be multiples. Now, there are, in custom, other ways of doing this. Some organizations, we've got a lot of organizations that are actually bus companies. And in that case, you could have 10 or 12 people on a bus, what you don't want to do is create five or six separate incident reports, one for each person. So in those cases, what we've done is we've customized it so that you can, within a single report, list all of the different incidents that have occurred in uh, during one, one single event. Do you have another question, Sarah? How can the monthly upload to hours work be sites be automated rather than individually entering for each site? And that is from Tim. All ah, right. It would be a case of our IT guys talking to customers' IT guys. And really, all it is is a simple mapping from whatever their system is into ours. Now, we have two ways of doing this. You can either send us a file at night, uh, every night, every week, every month, whatever, with that information in and it autom a program sits on our end waiting for that information to come in, automatically updates it. Or there's a thing called an API uh, where you can effectively do the same thing, but it's, uh, it's live. So you can update it directly into the documents in Myosh from your end. Now, how exactly APIs work? That's above my pay grade, unfortunately. But I'm told that that is the way that going forward, our developers would prefer it to work, but you can't have either. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Well, we've opened the floodgates. Um, Gwenta asks, in full investigation, if I marked by accident a wrong field, which asked me to fill a mandatory field, am I able to remove my selection? Yes, you are. You're always able to change your selections, but what will happen is, obviously, the first time you complete this document and you save it, it's logged the fact that you put whatever you put into the field that you put it into. If you then go and remove it, it's going to log the fact that you took it out as well. So you're free to do whatever you like, but the uh, audit log will record faithfully whatever it is you or anybody else did. Okay. Um, asks, do you enter ordinary, ordinary hours plus overtime hours? Uh, look, obviously not here. I guess overtime hours would have to be, if they're going to affect your statistics in a large way, I think probably they should be. But if it's something specific uh, from, from one site to another, you can probably lodge them at the site level. I mean, hours is... You know, if, you, if you've got 50,000 hours or 50,000 hours and 50,500 hours, it's not really going to affect your stats an awful lot. But if a lot of your a lot of the work that gets done in overtime is in overtime, then it's a good idea to add it. And if we if we need to build something in to specifically identify what's overtime, then we'd have to look at that. Although when it comes to classic, we can't. So when it comes to classic, you just have to add in all of your hours over time and standard and go with that. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions. And I have just put in the chat panel a link to a channel on Vimeo that houses all of our webinar recordings. Thank you, Nigel. And thank everybody for coming today. And please look out for future webinars. Please send any requests you have for webinars to sarah.oleary at myosh.com or support. And thanks, Nigel. We'll, we'll okay. hear you soon again. Bye. Bye.